Dominion. You know, this is a word that many people confuse in one way or the other. Christian hearts are such loving hearts that sometimes they don't understand taking dominion. What did God give us dominion over? And yet, how does that relate to us? Now, um, I, let's just take, we'll just kind of talk about this a minute before we go to the scripture. A shepherd is one who grazes the flock, feeds the flock. Now, every Christian shepherd is supposed to be just a wonderful heart, all right? But what happens if a wolf comes up to take a little baby lamb? You kill that sucker, okay? I mean, you get rid of him. So dominion has a kind of a double side, all right? Or if you're, if you're a little squeamish, just run him off, okay? And then he'll come back and get him later, okay? You know? But when you're supposed to protect a flock, you protect him. This is why Christ would say in one place, many people go out in sheep's... Uh, <laughs> there are many wolves in sheep's clothing, all right? And you, you want to use discernment and judgment. But God did give us dominion, and it is a beautiful thing. It truly is. But don't ever be, you know, Jesus would say in one place, if you are a preacher or teacher and you're going out and planting seeds, if you overload somebody's donkey, for example, if you were to get in somebody's face and say, there is no rapture, and they reached out and whack. I mean, you didn't use good judgment. So you just go ahead and turn the other cheek. It's your fault, okay? And so, and then, and then, hey, back off, okay? But if you go downtown and some wise guy comes up and whacks you on the, on the cheek, deck him, okay? You know, I mean, Christians are not second-class citizens, and we have dominion and good judgment. I know some people have a little trouble with that, but that's the way God intended it, okay? You can't take care of the sheep if you can't take care of yourself, okay? So therefore, you have to use judgment and discernment in all things. God loves can-do type people. So, having said that, let's go back where God originally, Genesis chapter 1, where He gave us dominion, and what did He give us dominion over? Dominion in the Septuagint, or in the Greek, which will be mostly in the New Testament, is kat akari o yo, and, uh, and it means to lord against or to lord control. It is done in good ways and it is done in bad ways. God never intends that you lead a flock by lording it over them. You teach and lead in love. But let's, let's pick it up with verse 27, chapter 1, Genesis. So God created man in his own image. And who was the man he created in his own image? Emmanuel, that is to say, God with us, Christ. In the image of God created he him, male and female uh, created he them. A six-day creation, he created them all. Verse 28, and God blessed them. Now, if you've got God's blessings coming out the gate, you're doing okay. That's good. And God said unto them, Be fruitful, and multiply, and replenish the earth, and subdue it. That means take charge, work it, and have dominion. Have dominion over what? Each other? No. Have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fowl of the air, and over every living thing that moveth or creepeth upon the earth. In other words, you take charge, and... Do your profession, work. Make, make the earth work for you. Take dominion over your profession. Be good at it. Now naturally as times change, things go from agriculture even to maybe, maybe rather than plowing, you build plows. Maybe you're a machinist. Or whatever, that still take dominion over that mill or over that lathe. And I mean make the best plows there is. But take dominion. Do, do what you do 
and always strive to do it better than anyone else, you know? I mean, really work at it. And will that mean you'll be doing it better than anyone else? And would that put pride? No, it just means that you're happy with your work. Okay? You're happy with yourself because you're doing okay. You're pleasing our Father. You take dominion over that. And that is dominion in a good sense. Now turn with me to Mark chapter 10. Mark chapter 10. And let's pick it up about verse 35. We got a couple of disciples here. Originally their mother told them, you go up there and talk to him and see if you two can move right up to the head of the class and be somebody. I want one of you to sit on the right hand and the other on the left in heaven on his throne. Verse 35, And James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came unto him, saying, Master, we would that thou shouldest do for us whatsoever we shall desire. Now that's asking a lot. Okay? You, you, first off, what's wrong with that? If you are really a lover of our Heavenly Father, you always want it to be His will. Before you sit down there, you'd want His permission, right? You would want, it to, you, you would want Him to want you to sit there. You wouldn't say, I'm going to take that seat. Okay. You'd, you'd get unseated in a hurry. All right? Verse 36, And He said unto them, What would you that I should do for you? Well, what would you like? 37, And they said unto him, Grant unto us that we may sit, one on the right, thy right hand, and the other on thy left hand, in thy glory. Now, first off, who does Jesus set at the right hand up? God. Now these two are getting way out of control here. Jesus himself sits at the right hand of God, so for them to ask, one of us wants to be on one side and one the other, they're trying to take God's place. And in ignorance, perhaps, in love, perhaps. Love can get you in a lot of trouble sometimes, making you love someone enough that if you're not careful, it can blind you to truth. That, that, that can, that's, I'll give you an example because that's kind of hard to understand how love could get you in trouble. But Peter loved Christ so much he drew a sword and lopped off a le an ear of a person when it was time for Christ to be delivered up. And Peter even said, there ain't no way we're letting them take you. And Jesus said, get behind me, Satan. Uh, Peter let his love deceive him for a moment about what had to be done, what Christ had spoken would happen. So did they do it out of love, perhaps? Did they do it out of, um, because their mother egged them on? They possibly had a little something to do with it. But I guess I could say it a different way. Who wouldn't want to be just as close to Christ as you could get in heaven? Okay, that's what we kind of all want. Ezekiel 44 lets you know who already has earned the right during the millennium. That happened in the first earth age. It's not up for grabs. Okay, it's for those that serve him, uh, as it is written. Okay, 38, And Jesus said unto them, You know not what you ask. Can you drink of the cup that I drink of and be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? And of course they say, 39, And they said unto him, We can. And Jesus said unto them, You shall indeed drink of the cup that I drink of and with the baptism that I am baptized with, with all, should, shall be, ye be baptized. Verse 40. But to sit on the right hand and on my left hand is not mine to give, but it shall be given to them from, for whom it is prepared. And again, as I said, that's, that happens in Ezekiel 44 as to who takes up uh, residence next to the uh, prince, okay, in the allotments of during the millennium. Verse 41, and when the ten heard it, when these other disciples heard those two, and we want to get up there with the head guru, we want to be head gurus, maybe. And when the ten heard it, 
they began to be much displeased with James and John. They didn't like it, not even a little bit. You know, and you know, uh, trying to play one-upmanship on the rest of them. They had all been out in that hot sun, treading those paths, preaching the word, teaching it. 42, listen carefully. But Jesus called them to him and said unto them, Ye know that they which are accounted to rule over the Gentiles exercise lordship. There's the word. Lordship. That's to rule it over them. And their great ones exercise authority upon them. I mean, they're dictators, so to speak. There's... Uh, they're, they're not going to give you any say. They're going to lord it over you. Now, Jesus is giving you an example of how he doesn't want you, if he gives you a little authority, if he gives you a little gift of being able to communicate and plant seeds out there in the old world, don't let it go to your head. You better be humble about it because it's his gift after all. He gave it to you. And that's, that's why people like to be around you when you plant seeds to them and ask you questions. It's because God gave you a gift. So don't, don't, don't let that go to your head and try to lord that over somebody. He said, you know, the people that are not even Christian out here, that's the way they do it. They lord it over people. Verse 43, But so shall it not be among you, you're not going to do that. But whosoever will be great among you shall be your minister. The, the word minister here doesn't mean preacher. It means servant. It means to minister to their needs. You know, to look out for them. Verse 44, And whosoever of you will be the chiefest shall be servant of all. After all, verse 45, For even the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, not to be waited on, but to minister, to wait upon, and to give His life a ransom for many. And He did. Now, He shows you an example following this of humility and of Going from two of the hot, I, 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 I'm uncomfortable using this, but I will. Two of the hot shot disciples, okay? They felt they were hot shots or they wouldn't have asked, all right? Again, I'm judging and shouldn't because it might have been just that purely out of love. But look who he helps just immediately following this. Verse 46, and they came to Jericho. And as he went out of Jericho with his disciples and a great number of people, there were a lot of people there he could have helped. Lots of them. Blind Bartimaeus, which Bar means son, and of course Timaeus means he was the son of Timaeus, as it says, the son of Timaeus, sat by the highway side begging. I mean, just a plain old beggar, and he's blind. He's got a begging robe on. And he heard that Jesus was going by. But he knew him by another name, which documents to you he knew a lot more Bible than many might have given him credit for. But I mean, we've got a whole multitude of people that Jesus could have touched and helped. We've got a lowly little beggar sitting over here beside the road. 48, and, and uh, 47 rather. And when he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out. Look what he cried and say, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. Now, no one told him, said it's the son of David going by. He knew out of Jesse would spring that root, would sprout, which would be David, which through him would come Messiah. He knew Jesus was Yeshua, Yahweh's Savior, by the title he calls him. 48, and many charged him that he should hold his peace. You be quiet. 
You're just a lowly beggar sitting there. Don't raise such a ruckus here. Be quiet. But he cried the more a great deal, Thou son of David, have mercy on me. 49, and Jesus stood still. He stopped in his tracks and commanded him to be called. Bring him here. And they, came, and they called the blind man, saying unto him, Be of good comfort, rise, he calleth thee. All that multitude. And he calls this beggar. Verse 50, And he, casting away his garment, he got rid of that. I want you to see the faith in this. He threw away that begging robe before he even got to Jesus. I feel he knew he was not going to need it any longer. I think that's what his faith was. He rose and came to Jesus. 51, And Jesus answered and said unto him, What wilt thou that I should do unto thee? And the blind man said unto him, Lord, that I might receive my sight. And I knew it was for good, I know it was for good reasons that he wanted that sight because he was already a student of God's word to be able to call him son of David. 52, and Jesus said unto him, Go thy way, thy faith hath made thee whole. And immediately he received his sight and followed Jesus in the way, in the road, planting seeds, teaching God's word, serving Jesus. So you see, it isn't who wants to be the greatest. It's how's your faith doing? How, how would you lord it over your fellow Christians who you're supposed to love? Well, I would hope not. And at the same time, are you a brave heart that knows when an enemy is near to protect that uh, Christian? To take charge? To, I won't use the word dominate, but to know when it's your right to have dominion over the enemy. Because that's a self-given right that Jesus Christ gave us in the book of Luke. He gave us dominion over all our enemies. That includes Satan, evil spirits. That's why the evil spirits run. When a person of God anoints a person and orders them in the name of Jesus back where they came from. They're gone. They're out. They have no choice. But picture that. It's very important. Don't. The common people out in the world lord it over people. Always. What, what is the. What would the subject be then? Fairness. Always be fair. Protect your people. But at the same time, be gentle with them. Don't lord it over them. And provide good food, good pasture, so that they have something to nibble on. Because people do like to nibble. They like to be fed, all right? If they don't get fed, they're just like sheep. They won't come back to that trough very long if something fresh isn't put out there that's real good, okay? That's the, way, that's the secret to serving God, you know, is feeding his sheep, not lording it over them, but gently leading, and at the same time, protecting. Okay, then uh, let's, let's go to another case here of uh, dominion. Let's go to the book of Acts. Let's see what uh, Paul might have had to do with this. Acts chapter 19, let's try it. Acts chapter 19, and we'll take it with verse 11. <clears throat> Paul was quite a sent one. Christ personally chose old Paul after he had already been crucified. Did that make any difference? No, he put him to work just the same. And Paul, though he was one of the hardest people against the church, he would be as zealous to work for it. Okay, 
so God could trust him after he was conversion. And as we pick it up in verse 11, you can understand why it's written. And God wrought special miracles by the hands of uh, Paul. Now, there's something you need to really absorb there. Because a lot of people will say, well, well, let's go another verse, and then I'll see if I can catch you asleep. How will that be? Verse 12. So that from his body, that's Paul's body, were brought unto the sick handkerchiefs or aprons, and the disease departed from them, and the evil spirits went out of them. Whew. What a Paul. No, that's not what it said. That's not what it said at all. Now go back to the verse I had read just before that. God, verse 11, not Paul, and God wrought special miracles by the hands of Paul. It was still God doing it, do you understand? It wasn't Paul any more than it's you. When you have the faith to hook into the mighty power of the Holy Spirit to go forth and do whatever it is that God would have you do, it is still God that brings forth the miracle. And that's great. That's wonderful. And that's what is so great in serving Him and understanding dominion. Because when we finish this lecture, you're going to understand there's one person that has dominion over everybody. I bet everyone in here knows exactly who that is. Has dominion over everyone because they're his children. Okay. And he expects to have that dominion. All right. So anyway, there, there we see. Don't, don't ever forget who it is that performs miracles. It's sure not you. And it sure wasn't Paul. It's our Father through the name of Jesus. Okay, 13. Then certain of the vagabond Jews. Now do you know who, who is the vagabonds? They, it was promised way back in verse 4. You'll be a vagabond the rest of your life. The Kenites. Okay. So they claim to be of our brother Judah, but it doesn't quite reach that far. Okay. Exorcist. They claim to be. Wonder how good they were at it. I mean, these, these, these are the high muckety ducks of the church of that day. Exorcist. Do you know what an exorcist is? That's one that cast out demons. Let's see how good they were at it. Took upon them to call over them which had evil spirits the name of the Lord Jesus, saying, We adjure you by Jesus whom Paul preacheth. Now think about that just a minute. Whom Paul preacheth. Do you see doubt all over? They didn't say, we know he's Jesus. What does Jesus mean? It's Yeshua's Savior. They, they said, we, this one that Paul teaches. In other words, they didn't believe on him or they would have called him by name. Verse 14. And there were seven sons of one Siva, a Jew, and chief of the priest, which did so. I mean, he, he, he would say, I, I'm gonna, I, they're all casting out these demons. I'm going to get in on the action here to draw, advertise for the church. Verse 15, And the evil spirit answered and said, They've ordered him out. And the demon says, Jesus I know. And Paul I know. But who are ye? Who do you think you are? They are in trouble, my friend, and that's why you don't ever want to mess with casting out demons unless you know what you're doing and have the faith to do it. Okay? Because they will do to you exactly what they do to this one. They're going to lord it over these boys. This is lording it over by the evil that God will use to his good. Watch it. 16, and the man in whom the evil spirit was leaped on them and overcame them. Overcame mean had dominion over them. I mean, they had no power, though they claimed they were exorcists. Boy, they were doing a good job, weren't they? 
I mean, they came, overcame them and prevailed against them so that they fled out of that house naked and wounded. I mean, they, they took the old uh, haul out of here route, okay? It was the only way to go, and they did. So, uh, did the demons win? You know, you can, you can teach by, a, by using a negative example when people are wise enough to know what the implanted meaning thereof is from God's dealings. Verse 17, And this was known to all the Jews and Greeks also dwelling at Ephesus, and fear fell on them all, and the name of the Lord Jesus was magnified. Why was it magnified? Because in the negative sense, they should have used it with faith, of course. It, you know, you can go out here and cast out all you want to try to cast out, but until you have the faith to know the Lord is behind you, I would advise you to keep your mouth shut. It's not, casting out demons is not a pleasant thing. I'll just tell you coming out the gate. It isn't pleasant at all. It can be real scary. Because you're dealing firsthand with Satan and some of his buddies. And you better have the power of Christ with you or you're gonna, you're, you will be in trouble. Okay? And um, kind of, again, experience helps in these things. Uh, um, I'll, I'll just share, a, I probably should, and many will call this digression. A person traveled here many... I can't say this on television. You'll have to excuse me. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to chicken out, and I'm not going to share it. Maybe some other time, but I don't want to do it on national television, okay? Uh, okay, so, so they were overcome. And uh, 17, and this was known, we got that, 18, and many that believed came and confessed and showed their deeds. Uh, uh, th this is why they saw how that without the power of Christ, there was evil in this world. And it was scary. I mean, after all, these people claim to be exorcist preachers. And those demons just eat them up. And then Paul came along, and God working through him, and you see what happened. 19, many of them, also, which used curious arts, brought their books together and burned them before all men. And they counted the price of them and found it 50,000 pieces of silver. You know, uh, Ouija boards and witchcraft books and, um, and uh, so on and so forth. All those little goodies, you know. Um, 20 to complete. So mightily grew the word of God and prevailed. God's word prevailed. God's word had dominion. And you want to always see that it does, that it is taught properly. And that it, 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 that it uh, elevates the hearts of God's children, whereby they can feel good to know they have loved the, the Lord. So here... We, we have seen here where, yes, if you let him, even Satan will domineer. Even Satan will take over. He'll lord it over you. But as a Christian, you have power and authority over him, so only a fool would allow Satan to come into his house and take over, to laugh at him. And many times this happens and people are a little bit slow catching on to it. Because um, they, uh, I mean, you might have a couple just really get into a knockdown drag out over how somebody opened the toothpaste. And here the two are arguing about this and Satan's over in the corner of your house laughing his head off. And you two are going at it big time. He loves that. You know, he really loves to get you going. And you know what he says then? He looks up to God and he says, now what do you think about him? Just like he did Job. So you see, you want to, he's sneaky. Don't let him move into your family. Take charge. Okay, let's go to 1 Peter. 
And we're going to go all the way to chapter 5. All the way to chapter 5, first book of Peter. We'll be teaching this book real soon. Chapter 5 and verse 1. And chapter 5, verse 1 reads, The elders which are among you I exhort. You know, elders are supposed to... That's, you know, the age doesn't have anything to do with an elder like this. It's how, how, how elderly you are in God's Word. Okay. Who am also an elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ and also a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed. Uh, I'm going to talk to you and I want to tell you what I want you to do. And when it comes to planting seeds or just being a Christian, you know, um, if you're a baby in Christ, and I hope none of you think you are because you're not. Somebody that just can stand milk and if you drop a little meat on them, they, they scream and yell and head for the closet, okay? But um, that can handle meat of God's Word, okay? What does he say do? Verse 2, Feed the flock of God which is among you, taking the oversight thereof. See that it's done, in other words. Not by constraint. In other words, don't, don't get a gun and go out here and say, we're having church here and now. Round them up. Okay. You, you don't hold people by constraint, but by love. By loving God's Word. Okay, But willingly... Not for filthy lucre, but of a ready mind. A mind absorbed in God's Word is what he's telling you. Ready to go out and share the knowledge that you have gently. You know. I mean, you may know so much that if you just dumped it all on a little person with tender ears, it'd sink their boat. You've got to be gentle. Easy does it. So many people blow their ministry just like that, you know, because they want people to know how much they know. It's just so important. I want to tell you everything I know. Well, they can't handle it. You've got to do it one step at a time. Okay. Be gentle. Verse 3, neither as being lords over. Don't lord it over them. Here's that Greek word again. Neither as being lords over God's heritage, but being in samples to the flock. Humble, taking that uh, gentle word forth and uh, living that life whereby people can see and understand what brings forth God's blessings. And when the chief shepherd shall appear, ye shall receive a crown of glory that fadeth not away. That's what He promises you. If you plant those seeds when you have an opportunity, and, and you be an adult about it, all right? When you were a child, you spake as a child. When you mature and receive the Word, be gentle. You can tell. You know, God gave us minds that we can talk to somebody and size them up in five minutes. You know just about where that person is. If you've practiced any at all in understanding Christians, in five minutes, you've just about got where to start. That, there's nothing, that, I don't mean that as a negative statement. That gears your mind to theirs, giving you a starting point on knowing where to begin and bring them to you. Okay, gently. It, it isn't, it isn't important how much you know. What's in, it is important, but not to them right at the moment. What is important is can you, do you have the gift to bring them to where you are in God's Word or wherever it is God would have them go? That's the gift of God. And doing it in such a way, not forcing it, not lording it over, and that means you've got to kind of hold your cool, too, you know. People, 
when you start treading on new ground for some people, I don't know why it is, but some people like to argue over religion. Have you ever noticed that? Sometimes they can get hot. If you, if you get on their toes a little bit, it, and you can even say, well, show me that in the Bible. And I, I, got a, I received a letter um, two days ago from a lady that said, this good friend of mine kept saying, when Eve ate the apple, and I finally, I told her, she's a Sunday school teacher, and I finally told her, that's not biblical. Oh, yes it is. Well, show me in the Bible. And she went home and looked and looked and looked. Naturally, she didn't find it. But, um, I mean, she had heard that old story long enough that to her it became biblical. So that's why you have to be real gentle because sometimes, boy, they will, as far as they're concerned, that's Bible. And if nothing else, my grandpa has taught that for years. Well, don't mess with grandpa. <laughs> okay. <laughs> be careful. You can, you can really lord it over somebody. You don't ever lord it over grandpa or you're in trouble. All right. Respect grandpa, but stick to the Bible. That's what it really melts down to. Aren't you all enjoying this? I'll tell you what. Uh, this is so over simple. But, you know, there comes a time when we should do it. We should go back over it to gear our minds to, to whereby we're fertile to be able to plant seeds and let them grow vigorously because after all, this is the second day of spring when stuff is supposed to grow, plant, seeds planted. So hang tough with it. Okay, humble your, uh, well, let's go with verse six. Humble yourselves therefore under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time. And he always will, okay? He always keeps his word and he never forgets a servant. Casting all your care, that's to say your anxieties, or let me, let me translate it a little different and it may be, mean more. How about worries? Casting all your worries upon him for he careth for you. What it's saying is if you are a worry wart, you're wasting your time. You should give it to him. After you pray, does that mean then you can quit? Uh-uh. If you quit, guess what? You'll do without. But tell him to help you and go for it vigorously. You know, can do. And you'll be just fine. But you must. Uh, um, show me a worried mind and I'll show you a person that's not 100%. They're not sharp. You know Why? They're worried. And uh, worry will take away that spark that makes you creative. So take a chance. Go for it. Okay, okay that's, that's what it said. Verse 8, be sober. That means sincere. Be sincere with God. Be vigilant. That's, be aware. Keep your eyes open. Keep your mind open. Because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. How about you? Are you available? Well, I'll, you know, don't be, I'm going to tell you how you can really get in trouble. Well, I'll just show him. That's kind of the wrong attitude. You know, I, I wouldn't argue with Satan if I were you. I would not threaten him. Just take care of business in the name of Jesus Christ. Order him where he belongs. No, no jeering. No hopscotching. Do it. Don't mess with him. Because he, he would like to take your family. You know, uh, some might say, but you don't understand. You teach that God's elect or a family that were pre-chosen. Well, who do you think Satan wants worse than anyone? If he's got everybody else, naturally he would love to have you. So he's going to try a lot harder to have you and your family than he is somebody out here that's uh, deceived in the world anyway. He's looking for you. Verse 9, uh, and, and do you know something? If you keep on guard, he hadn't got a prayer. 
I don't want to leave someone frightened or weak. He hasn't got a prayer. But you know something? Every time you win, be real careful when you start celebrating and rejoicing when you win over Satan. Because while you're rejoicing, when you hear that saw saw in a circle right out underneath you, you know he hasn't given up, okay? Verse 9, who resist steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. In other words, um, uh, there's nothing uncommon. Things that happen to you happen to other people. Hey, handle it. And you might say, well, it's hard. Well, show the brethren how to handle it. Something it's like water off a duck's back. Bring it on. Okay? Don't... Never, never be afraid of Satan uh, when you know you have the power and the authority over him. Um, and verse 11, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Dominion to who? To God. Now in closing, Jeremiah, go to the book of Jeremiah. Now let's take chapter 3. We'll go pretty close to the beginning here. Let's find out. Let's find out who really has dominion over everyone and he expects people to listen to him and to understand. Jeremiah chapter, four, uh, chapter 3 verse 14. What this has to do is with the final restoration do you know what the final restoration is? That's when Christ returns and the world is put back in order with Christ being with us through the millennium. Verse 14 of chapter 3, Jeremiah, and in closing, this will be our final place. Turn, O backsliding children, saith the Lord, for I am married unto you. You're mine. And I will take you one of a city and two of a family, and I will bring you to Zion. Well, why wouldn't he take them all? Because they're not worthy. Take you means I have dominion over you that follow me. I take you. I'm married to you. You're mine. And I'm taking you with me to Jerusalem, to Zion. Verse 15, And I will give you pastors according to mine heart, which shall feed you with knowledge and understanding. And it shall come to pass, not maybe, it shall come to pass when you be multiplied and increased in the land. In those days, saith the Lord, they shall say no more the ark of the covenant of the Lord. Neither shall it come to mind, neither shall they remember it, neither shall they, uh, neither shall they visit it, neither shall that be done anymore. Well, why wouldn't they want to visit the Ark of the Covenant? Well, let me give you a clue. What did the Ark of the Covenant represent? Or what was it symbolic of? The mercy seat. Well, if Christ is sitting on it, the real thing, and he's with us, why would you want that thing? Got it? In other words, Christ has returned. And when you go there, it's he. Well, let's continue on. 17. At that time, they shall call Jerusalem the throne of the Lord. Why? Because he's there. And all the nations shall be gathered unto it, to the name of the Lord, to Jerusalem. Neither shall they walk any more after the imagination or the stubbornness of their evil heart. In those days, the house of Judah shall walk with the house of Israel. They're two gathered back into one stick, and they shall come together out of the land of the north to the land that I have given for an inheritance unto their fathers. In other words... Almighty God, they're back in Beulah. Beulah means married land. Christ has returned. And people have the real thing. They don't need something that symbolizes something anymore. 
and he has dominion and he will practice that dominion and it will be the sweetest days that we have ever witnessed because it will be the beginning of the millennium. Dominion, always be humble before our heavenly father and yet at the same time be strong, be very gentle with the flock and feed them but at the same time if somebody threatens the flock or tries to disillusion them or mislead them squash them okay you take care of the sheep and take care of god's business and god will always take care of you dominion is a beautiful thing but there are two sides to everything and um so be alert, be wise, be gentle, but most of all, be loving to the Father. And let me tell you how you can test yourself out. Do you really want everything in your life to happen to God's will? If you do, you're getting there. Because if you love him as much as you should, you wouldn't want anything that he wouldn't want you to have. That's just the way it is. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Father, for your word. We thank you, Father, for the dominion that you have given us over our enemies. We thank you, Father, for the dominion that you take over us, for we love you, we follow you, and we ask your blessings to these that they may be a blessing to all they come in contact with in Jesus, Yeshua's precious name. Amen. Free introductory package. Say, this is something we would like to offer for a one-time gift to all the new folk that study with us. This introductory package gives you a monthly newsletter, which means each month you will receive a newsletter with a Bible study on it. Hey, raising funds? No way. We're not beggars, we're Bible teachers. That's what it consists of, a tape catalog that will give you all the topics that are covered. And the Mark of the Beast tape. What is this Mark of the Beast? Is it really on your forehead? No, Satan's considerably more intelligent than that. It's in your forehead, which is to say in your mind. Have you been deceived? This is a free offer to you, one time to each new student, say, Find out what's really happening and what the story is on the mark of the beast. Feel there must be excuses rather than teaching truth. I can't handle that. I either have to teach it as it is or not teach it at all. And so there it is. Carl from, but in answer to your question, Adam did not absolutely did not have a wife before Eve, period, okay? That's uh, fairy tales made up by higher critics and would-be professors. Carol from, Carl from Texas, I hope I know you can please help. I know, but I hope you can please help me. I think I'm on track, but not sure. Try to, in second Corinthians 12, 2, the third heaven. Is that referring to three ages of heaven as uh, there were three ages of earth of the world? You got it. It's talking about he was taken to the third heaven age to see what it was like in the eternity. Okay, God, God can do that. Uh, Ramona from Oklahoma. Where specifically does it say the fallen ones, Nephilim, refuse to be born a woman? I searched Genesis 6. I can't find it. Could you please help me out? Thanks to all at Shepherd's Chapel. Why does it say this also in the strong? Where does it say this also? In the you look up the word geba. Take it to the Hebrew. You have to, you have to cover this in the Hebrew, but probably the easiest thing for you is to go to the book of Jude where it says these uh, fallen angels are in holding chains for destruction because they left their place of habitation. Rather than being born of woman, I'm, my words now, they left their place of habitation and came to earth because woman was here. Okay, Betty from Pennsylvania, I thought you said there was an age before the beginning, that is Genesis 1-1. Would you please explain? No, 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 no. 
Genesis 1.1, in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth, period. It didn't say when. It was millions of years ago. That was the beginning. All right? And, um, uh, and then verse 2 says, and the earth, the Hebrew manuscripts, was not created void and without form, but it became void and without form at Satan's rebellion. Okay? That's, uh, uh, well, we just taught that in, in, Gen in Genesis, and you need, that's so very important that you understand that. So, uh, Denise from Oklahoma, I really enjoyed studying Genesis with you, but I have one question. Why did the angel of the Lord wrestle with Jacob? I have read the verses many times, and the answer escapes me. Thank you so much for teaching. Well, what was Jacob's name? It was Contender. And, um, and heel grabber, okay? And he fought for everything. And the Lord was just kind of playing with him, all right? Just uh, testing his ochre a little bit. How, how much would he fight for it? How proud was he of his manhood that he could cut it, that he could do it, can-do type person? Well, God checked him out, and hey, he, did, he wouldn't quit. I'm sure the ground was tore up pretty good where they wrestled. And finally, the Lord had to touch the ligament to kind of put his old uh, hip out of place before uh, he finally quit. And then he said, I'm not quitting now unless you give me a blessing. And he changed his name to Israel. That's, th he was proving him, okay? Um, you know, our Father has feelings of love, of uh, joy. He smiles, he laughs, he, he, he likes, he has a sense of humor. And um, uh, he enjoys things just like anyone else does. So uh, use your imagination a little bit. Dottie from Connecticut. I wrote to you once before about a blood transfusion. And she was told that if she had a transfusion, she'd go to hell. Well, they're lying to you, okay, because of their ignorance of the Hebrew. Blood transfusion is not even mentioned in the Word of God. The only thing that is mentioned in the Word of God concerning blood is don't eat chickens that have been choked, okay. Don't eat beef that's been choked, what the Bible says, they must be bled, okay? If you do not bleed an animal that is butchered, the blood putrefies the flesh. It's not fit to eat, really, okay? It's just not good at all. And what God is saying, do not eat blood, do not eat meat that has the blood in it. Now, uh, I could be a little more, I guess I will be. In the days of the Bible, they did not have refrigerators. I mean, they had, they had nothing that would preserve meat other than salt itself. So it had to be preserved in the way of bleeding it and purifying it as best they could uh, in the way they had to work with. And God said, do not. In other words, it would make you sick. You'd die. That's why God said never eat meat with blood in it. That's not butchered properly is what it's talking about. Richard and Helena, a friend of ours would like for you to explain to us about verse 215 in the Song of Moses. Verse 15, take us the little foxes, the little foxes that spoil the vines, for our vines have tender grapes. The, tender, the Hebrew is uh, tender blossoms. Do you know what the little foxes symbolize? Kenites. It means look out for the little Kenites that like to run in and knock the developing blossoms off the flower. Wh what happens if you knock the blossoms off? You don't get any grapes. You don't get any fruit. And if you let the Kenites mess up your life and uh, bring deceit and deception into your religion, your, your belief of God's Word, 
you're not going to have any truth either. That's what it's talking about, okay? <clears throat> and what a, what a beautiful book, the Song of uh, Solomon. The greatest love story ever told is Christ's love for his people. Uh, Margaret from Colorado, does the Bible tell you to ask people if they are Christian or is there people who accept Christ in their heart and don't need someone saying, are you a Christian? I believe, um, I believe certain, I believe speaking, I believe actions speak louder than words. Well, I totally agree with you. You know, you know whether someone is Christian or not after you've been around them a minute. And you know when they're not. And uh, you don't have to go around saying, do you love Jesus? Okay. You just know it because of their action. That's true. And actions do speak louder than words. Non-Christians, you can find a lot of things among non-Christians, such as people blowing themselves up and a lot of other things where we try very desperately to preserve life as best we can and to help people think properly, all right? So uh, actions speak louder than words. All right, hey, I'm out of time again. I love you all a bunch. You know why? Because you enjoy studying our Father's Word chapter by chapter, verse by verse, the way God wrote it, sent it. Most of all, it makes His day. And when you make His day, He's going to make yours. We are brought to you by your tithes and offerings. If we've helped you, you help us keep coming to you. Bless God, He will always bless you. What a chapter, Genesis 49, the blessings brought upon our people. Now, one thing that's really very important, and that's this, that you stay in His Word. Hey, every day, set aside a little bit of time. Every day in His Word is a good day, even with trouble. You know why? Jesus is the living Word. Hearing God's Word with understanding will change your life. We hope you have enjoyed studying God's Word here on the Shepherd's Chapel Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. If you would like to receive more information concerning Shepherd's Chapel, you may request our free introductory offer. Our introductory offer contains the Mark of the Beast audio tape, our monthly newsletter with a written Bible study, a tape catalog, and a list of written reference works available through Shepherd's Chapel. To request our free introductory offer by telephone, call 800-643-4645, 24 hours a day. You may also request our introductory offer by writing to Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Once again, that's Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas. 72736. We invite you to join us for the next in-depth Bible study each weekday at this same time. Thank you for watching today's program and God bless you.